end and roll in a new year. Um, we also kind of know things don't seem to change too much, do they, from one day to the next. Uh, but one of the things I think would be a great way for us to start off a new year is by doing more, spending more time in God's Word. So I'm Beth Hoving, and I teach the Wednesday night midweek uh, Bible study here at New Hope, and I would love to have you all join us. We meet from 6.30 to 7.30 here in the sanctuary, and it's wonderful to get a kind of a shot in the arm and more of that spiritual food that we need during the week, especially uh, in the difficult world we're, we're living in. And we're going to be taking a look at seeing God more clearly in the midst of this difficult world, uh, what, what changes and what stays the same. So I hope to see you all there. I'm awfully glad you're here this morning to worship with us. Uh, if you turn your attention to the screen for further announcements, thank you. Good morning and welcome to worship at New Hope Presbyterian. Happy New Year! We are all praying and expecting 2021 to be a marvelous year of God's blessings. Because it's the first Sunday of the month, we'll be taking communion today. We're also excited to get back to full Wednesday night programming for all ages, beginning Wednesday, January 13th. You can find more details about that in the e-news or on our website. We appreciate you taking the time to sign in to our friendship pad every week. You can share prayer concerns with us or let us know that you're watching us at home or here on campus. If you'd like to continue giving generously to God's kingdom, we have four ways for you to do that. You can text to give or give online. You're welcome to mail a paper check at the address you see here on your screen. Or if you're worshiping on campus, go ahead and drop it off in one of those white boxes as you prepare to exit the building. Pastor Mike is kicking off a great new series for us today, and we're glad you're here.
morning, New Hope. Whether it's a call to worship or a call to solemn assembly, one thing is common, whatever you call it. They focus on who God is, his character. So let's stand as we hear this call. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, darkness shall cover the earth, thick darkness the peoples, but the Lord will arise upon you, and his glory will be seen upon you, and nations will come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your rising. Join together in prayer. Lord, in this world which belongs to you, there are many things that are unsettled. But one thing remains true. You are true. And you are a solid rock for your people. And so, Lord, open our eyes to, speak, to see spiritual truth that you have rescued us You've taken us out of the dominion of darkness if we are in Christ, and you have placed us in his kingdom. And now, Lord, we are completely loved by you because of Jesus. It is his work on our behalf that gives us confidence to come before our holy God, for you are holy, and we worship you, one God, eternal, forever and ever. Amen. God tells us in Proverbs 28, verse 13, that whoever conceals his transgressions will not prosper, 
but he who confesses and forsakes them will obtain mercy. So let's go to the Lord, rich in grace and mercy. Hear our prayer, Lord, and let our cry for help come to you. We remember, Heavenly Father, how it is Jesus who said, I am the light of the world, and whoever follows me will not be in darkness, but shall have life and light. So we thank you, Lord Jesus, that not only are you Emmanuel, but that you live in us and you prompt us by the Holy Spirit. We hear your voice and we follow you, but our following is so inconsistent, Father. You prompt us, it's time to put down the phone, but we find it very interesting. And you invite us to pour out our hearts to you, our fears, our questions, our doubts. And instead, we opt for an easy way out, sugar, perhaps, or television. You prompt us, it's a good time to reach out to this brother or sister who's hurting. And we responded, we're so busy. Thank you that you are faithful and that our relationship with you does not depend on our faithfulness, but upon your faithfulness to us. So in our world where sin is serious, where evil is picking at our guilt and where pain is no illusion, open our eyes to see Jesus. He's the answer to our sin. He's the answer to chaos and the strife of this world. And he will one day break the brokenness, kill death, destroy destruction, and swallow every sorrow. And so we give you thanks and praise in the name of Jesus, who has taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The one who confesses and forsakes their sin will obtain mercy. Here again, the gospel, the assurance of salvation in Christ Jesus. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, the new is here. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Let's delight in God's grace as we sing together standing.
Church of the Lord Jesus Christ, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let's prepare our hearts for hearing God's word. Amen. You may be seated. I tell you, it is great to be, to be back. We were out last week and um, really, really missed the fellowship of New Hope Church. Those of you online, we experienced a little of what, what you all are experiencing every week as we um, tried to go to another church here in town. We showed up. They weren't having services, and so we went to yet another church, and they too were not having services. And so what we did, we, we got out the phone, we put it up on the dash, and we had drive-in church. It was a lot of fun. Oh. But thank you so much to Lucas Tanner. Please keep him in your prayers as he is ministering with uh, Reformed University Fellowship down at um, Florida Gulf Coast. Thank you so much, Lucas, if you're tuning in. Thank you for, for bringing the word to us so effectively last week. Thank you to a wonderful staff and great volunteers for an incredible Christmas season. Thank you so very much. I mean, the, the, it, it's hard to believe that just this time, the last time I saw it, there was a huge tree right here, and it's gone. So thank you for the decorating. Thank you for the de-decorating as well. 
it's a lot of work on both sides. Thank you for all of that. Thank you, Brad. He's normally our business manager and yet tapped his, the, I guess it's the right side or the left side, I don't know, the other side of the brain to play for us this morning as Ed and Katie Ball, or Ed, Ben and Katie Ball are on a much needed one week respite as well. And thank you all for, for gathering together as the body called New Hope. You know, whenever the body of the church comes together, there is a, I, I don't want to say power, but there is a connection that allows us to draw together not only physically, but spiritually as well. And that translates to you at, at New Hope Online at home. And when we gather, we should pray together. Because again, celebrating that unity, but also celebrating that mindset that the Lord hears us when we pray. So let's begin our New Year's praying together. Let's pray. Gracious God, thank you that you are the Alpha and the Omega. Were you simply the alpha, simply the beginning, then we would step into these days full of fear and full of trepidation. If you were only the one who set everything in motion, if you were just the creator, then we would have much to fear because then everything would be left to chance. Everything would just be spinning. And yet you are not just the alpha. You are not just the creator. You are the omega. You are the author and you are the finisher of our faith. And so, Father, even though we step into days that we don't know what they hold, we know that we trust in the omega, the beginning and the end. So, Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for this year. Thank you for this time. Thank you that you have seen fit, that you have chosen us to live in this time. And, Father, forgive us for, for our uncertainty. Forgive us for when we are tempted to walk by sight and not by faith. Strengthen our faith. Strengthen our resolve. Strengthen our sight. Father, we thank you that you love us so much that you've given us your son, and we celebrate that today. We celebrate not only the fact that we are a family, the body of Christ, knit together as we just read in 2 Corinthians 5. But we also celebrate that you have purchased a place for us in heaven. You tell us, don't let your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in you. You say, in my Father's house, there are many rooms, many mansions. If it were not so, you wouldn't have you, you would have told us. You tell us that where you go, you prepare a place so that where you are, we may be. And so, Father, we come to you right now, maybe with fresh grief for those that we have lost over the last year, husbands and wives and sons and daughters. And yet, Lord, if they are in you, they are not lost. They are more found than they have ever been. Thank you for that hope. Thank you for that hope that is sure and solid, that is an anchor for the soul. Thank you that we know right where they are. They are in those mansions that you have prepared. And Father, as we look forward into 2021, we, we hear of diseases and cancers and things that are life-threatening, but Lord, we know that anyone who is in you, their life is not threatened in any way. And so, Father, we look to you for the completion of your purpose in their lives. Give us strength. Give us grace. Give us mercy. Father, where you would see fit, bring healing. Bring healing to those that are in the hospital today. Bring, bring healing to those that are in hospice today. Bring healing to those that are confined at home today. Father, we know that you can. And so we pray that you would touch them, that they would be reminded of your grace, reminded of your presence, reminded of your promises. Father, we could not come to you as a body and as, as your church without lifting up our leaders and ask, Father, that you would give wisdom but that you would not only give wisdom, but that they would receive that wisdom because you tell us any of us who lacks wisdom, we should ask you, but we should ask expecting to do it. 
And so, Father, we do pray for those that you have placed in authority over us and ask that you would give them that wisdom and that they would be humble enough to listen and to follow. Father, we pray for our military around the world, for our other first responders, that you would give them grace, that you would give them mission, that you would give them purpose, but mostly that you would give them peace. Not as the world gives peace. You tell us in this world we will have trouble, but take courage. You have overcome the world. So use them for your purposes, Lord, to bring a type of peace that is just the foreshadowing of the peace that lies in you. Father, we do pray for our church. We pray for Pastor Eddie and Roxanne as they are on to a new calling in their life. And we ask, Father, that you would give them your richest blessings as they have blessed us. Father, we pray for your church called New Hope, that in 2021, Father, that we would stand out in a dark and perverse generation, that we would be your light, that we would bring your light, that, that you would light our path. Father, we pray that we would be people of your word because your word is a light to our path, and we need that light so desperately. Father, we thank you that you love us so much that you have given us your son. We thank you for the grace that you have shown to us. We thank you for drawing us together from near and from far to be your church, to be your people, to be your children. And so as your children, we cry out, Abba, Father, and ask that you would hear our prayers because we offer them in the strong and matchless and mighty name of Jesus Christ, our hope, our Lord, our God himself. Amen. 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 Well, it is a new year. Somebody said that now we can truly say that hindsight is 2020. I'm sure you'll hear that like a thousand times pretty soon, but still, it, it is true. This morning we have the opportunity to sort of step into a new series, a new year, a new time. And as we think about, as we think about 2020, it would be easy to start listing off all of the things that in our mind and in our sight went wrong. It would be hard to remember the first three months of the year when things were going so right. I mean, on so many levels, the economy was roaring. There was a new sense of peace in the Middle East. There were all of these things going on around the world. And then all of a sudden in March, it came, in our minds anyway, crashing to a halt. It would be easy to get wrapped up on that. But today and for this series, we want to look forward. We don't want to look back. We want to look forward. The mission statement for New Hope Presbyterian Church. You may or may not have known this. If you go on the website, you can find out a lot more about it, newhopefortmyers.org. But it's living out the gospel together. Did you know that? Did you know that was our mission statement? Living out the gospel together. Now, that statement didn't just sort of come out of thin air. Pastor Eddie and a team of very, very gifted and qualified folks sat for almost a full year examining, looking at the culture that is, that is new hope, looking at the things that we value deeply, the things that we say, if you take these away from us, we are no longer new hope. And so for the next several weeks, we're going to be looking at some of those values. And today we're going to start with one called lavish grace. We believe and we value lavish grace. That comes from this, this verse in 1 John. It says, see what great love the Father has lavished on us. Isn't that a great word? Everybody say lavished. It's a rare word, isn't it? Because it's an expensive word. It's something that, that we don't use all that often. Lavished grace. That we should be called the children of God. And that's what we are. The reason the world doesn't know us is that it didn't know him. Dear friends, now we are children of God. Lavish grace. 
This morning, we're going to look at at lavish grace, and I'm going to give you a sentence, and we're going to kind of flesh that out as we go along here. See, God gives extravagant love and mercy, so we give it generously to others. God gives us that lavish grace, and that's what it means to have a value of lavish grace. Again, from the website, God gives us his extravagant love and mercy, and so we give it generously to others. This is demonstrated by reaching out to the hurt and marginalized people, not only in in Fort Myers, but around the world, literally through missions. He does it by by going out of our way to remember the forgotten and embrace the hard to love. That's what it means to have lavish grace. We lavish it upon others, undeserved love and forgiveness that hasn't earned and can never be repaid. That's grace. We offer God's love and grace when sin divides relationships and communities. Our sentence that we're going to flesh out based on lavish grace, based on what does it mean to live in lavish grace? What does it mean to have a new year and a new you? What does it mean to actually walk out lavish grace in our lives and in our community? We're going to look at this sentence. Lavish grace produces deep gratitude and overflowing generosity. Everybody say it together. Lavish grace produces deep gratitude and overflowing generosity. Let's break that apart a little bit. Let's talk a little bit about lavish grace. Lavish grace. There was a guy, he was known in his time as John the Blasphemer. John the Blasphemer. In in fact, it's kind of a a, a strange reference, but there's at least when you go back and you look it up, at least on Wikipedia, which we know has got to be true, right? In Wikipedia, after all. But it says that there's two words in the, in the cursing lexicon attributed to this guy named John the Blasphemer. John the Blasphemer was a sailor, and he was so, he was such a jerk, basically. One time he fell overboard, and the crew, instead of throwing things to float that he could hang on to, started throwing harpoons at him. That's true. That, that's what happened to this guy. He was, had an anger issue, and John the Blasphemer got angry at the captain of the ship, and so he took a swing at it. Well, of course, they threw him in the brig, Right? And while he was in the brig, he worked with some of the other prisoners to stage a mutiny, to kill the captain and all the crew and take over the ship. So when they got out of the brig, the night that they got out that they were going to Im- implement this plot to take over the whole ship, there was a, a terrific storm. It came and everybody thought they were going to die. And John the Blasphemer, like so many others, maybe in that day, maybe in our day as well, when he thought he was going to die, he made the, the, the promise, God, if you just get me out of this, what? I'll do anything you say. Well, God did get him out of it. And John the blasphemer gave his heart to Jesus Christ. And John the blasphemer, we may know him better as John Newton. He's the one who wrote that hymn, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. You see, it's grace that takes someone from being John the blasphemer to John the hymn writer, the poem writer, who had an amazing grasp of what it meant to be filled with grace. You know, so many of us, we, we, we're, we're so used to that word grace, we forget the depth of the grace. We forget that, that God's grace is the only thing that changes us. Let me ask you this. What if, to start 2021, somebody were to come up to you and say, you know all that debt that you're carrying into 2021? I'm going to pay it off. What if if somebody came up and said, you know all of that that debt, your mortgage, everything, everything that's interest-bearing, credit cards, car debt, every debt you've got, I'm going to pay it off. How would you feel about them? What, What would you say? Thank you, Jesus, right? I mean, what difference would that make in your life if someone paid off all of your debt? And not only that, what if, what if somebody said, not only am I going to pay off your past debt, I'm going to pay off your debt from now until you die. I'm going to pay off everything that you're ever going to get indebted to. I'm going to pay it off. How would you feel towards that person? They would change everything about you, wouldn't they? 
Well, what that is in a financial sense, Jesus has done in a spiritual sense. He has paid off every debt we've ever had, and he will pay off every debt we ever will have. You see, that's grace. That's lavish grace. The Bible puts it this way. His glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace. You know, grace is, is actually, it's, a, it's an old Greek term. I found this fascinating. I didn't know this until this week. It's an old Greek term. And, and what it was was when somebody stronger and more powerful gave something to someone who was weaker and more vulnerable. We were watching that series, The Crown. Has anybody seen that? The Crown about the Queen, right? And I'd always wondered, you know, when, when they get in front of the Queen, they don't say, Your Highness. Have you noticed? They say, Your Grace. Your Grace. Your Grace. Where that comes from, that concept. When they get in the, in the presence of someone who has more power than they do, who has more position than they do, who can change their position in life, they don't call them Your Highness. They say, Your Grace. Your grace, will you give me some of what you've got so that I can better my position? That is a very earthly understanding of what grace is, but that's where it comes from. And so when we think about grace, when we think about lavish grace, we have to think in terms of this is a God who has everything, everything, the riches of God's grace. We who have nothing, he has given that to us. You see, that's Grace, that's the kind of grace that we cannot in any way ever buy or steal or take or even borrow. It's got to be given to us. Now, for some of us, it's like, yeah, Mike, I've heard that. I've heard that. I've heard that. I've heard that so many different times. I get it. But some here today, even when we talk about this, even when we back it up with Scripture, even when we show it to be the truth, you're like, I just can't believe in a God like that. I just can't believe that there is a God like that who would, who would do that for me. Because the God in my mind is the one who judges. The God in my mind is the one who is on the throne and the one that says, you got out of whack, I'm, I'm going to whack you down. Because even though we don't like to think that way, it is the way we are wired to think. Because you see, we understand what it means to owe and we want to pay that back. We understand what it means to, to not be right, and we want to try to make it right. And God says, you can never pay it back. You can never make it right. It is a gift. In fact, it says it this way. Lavish grace, Tony Evans said it this way. Lavish grace is the inexhaustible favor or goodness of God, giving us what we could not earn, do not deserve, and would never be able to repay. It is unmerited favor. And he went on and he talked about, have you ever been to Niagara Falls? And the water, anybody ever been to Niagara Falls on the Canadian side? On the American side, it just kind of drops off, but on the Canadian side, the power of that water. Can you imagine if that water ever stopped? It never has. And as I, I presume it never will, or, or maybe this one's a little bit better because we're near the beach. Can you imagine the waves? If one time the waves just stopped, it doesn't happen. That's the way God's grace is towards us. Inexhaustible, inexhaustible favor of God. Do you see God that way? Have you experienced his amazing grace? You see, going back to our verse, 1 John 3, 1, see what great love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. You see, there's two ways that, that a lot of us approach grace. Some of us see it and say, it's, it's, it's just too good to be true. It's unbelievable. I cannot accept that because it's just too good. I'm not good enough to receive that. And if that's you today, I, I, I want to challenge you. I want to challenge you today to say, I receive what I cannot earn. I grab hold of what is grabbing hold of me. I take your grace and I bring it into me. But there's another group. There's some other of us 
that sit here and say, yeah, yeah, that great stuff, that's fine. That's for those people that, that really need it. But me, I'm doing pretty good. I just need some polish here and there. I mean, I have my days, but on the other hand, I'm, I'm doing pretty good. You know, especially when compared to that guy over there. It's like the two guys that were out bear hunting. And one of them, every morning, he'd wake up and, and work out and all that kind of stuff, and the other one just kind of lay there. And um, they, the, the one that just kind of laid there all the time came to the other one and said, why do you do all that working out, all that kind of stuff? Do you really think you're going to outrun a bear if he starts chasing us? And he said, well, I don't have to outrun the bear. I just have to outrun you. <laughs> you see, that's what happens when we start using ourselves as a comparison. When we start saying, well, I, I may not be holy, but I'm holier than thou. I'm holier than that one. I'm holier than the one over there. So really, God's grace, that, that's all well and good. But God got a pretty good deal when he got me. And some of us actually think that way. Some of us actually approach the throne of grace that way and say, Jesus, thanks for that. I got it from here. I'll take it. You see, grace... Grace says, uh-uh. Ephesians 2 says, you were dead in your sins and transgressions. You were dead. What can dead people do? What good are dead people? Well, maybe an insurance policy, but that's beside the point. You see, we can do nothing for ourselves. I like the way Tim Keller describes that. He says, for so many of us, we think that we were in the deep end of the pool flailing around, and God threw a life preserver to us called grace. In reality, we were at the bottom of the pool blowing bubbles, completely dead. And God reached down and pulled us out by his grace. Lavish grace. Lavish grace. Look what it says in Romans 8. He says, what shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Someone today needs to know and hear and grasp and understand that God is for you. God is for us. He does not accuse. He does not condemn. If you are in Christ, we read it a minute ago, you are a new creation. The old is gone. The new has come. Look at what he says in Isaiah 3. Yet the Lord longs to be gracious to you. He longs to be gracious to you. Therefore, he will rise up to show you compassion. Some of you in 2021, you need, to, you need to make this the year that you understand, that you grasp, and that you own this lavish grace. Look at what he says in Romans. I, uh, one of the ways to remember a passage is to, to put something with it. This, this passage will hit you like a two by four. Romans 2 by four. <laughs> Maybe you'll remember it. Or do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness, forbearance and patience, not realizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance? That's grace. That's lavish grace. That is lavish grace. And if we don't, if we don't grasp that, if we don't understand that, if we don't begin with that, if we start thinking that we've got it all together, we need to understand what, what Jeremiah said. He said, the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. You see, we, we can't spend enough time talking about grace, although on the other hand, it seems like all we do is talk about grace because that's all we've got. Because left to ourselves, we're dead. And our sins in our transgressions. But that verse goes on. It says, but because of his grace, he has made us alive. It's by grace we have been saved. I love the way Tim Keller says it. He says it this way. May you never get over the fact that God has invaded your life with grace. Invaded your life with grace. Not because you deserve it, but just because of who he is. Lavish grace. So let's go back to our sentence. Let's go back to our, our framework for this morning. Lavish grace produces deep gratitude. 
Once we understand that we are saved by grace, once we understand the depth of that grace, once we understand what God has done for us in his and through his grace, how do we respond? Only by deep gratitude. Gratitude is a byproduct of the way of seeing things of a certain worldview. In other words, we can get wrapped up in a worldview that says the world is falling apart, everything's coming off. We can, we can, as I prayed a minute ago, we can think of God as the alpha, the one that created it, and then now it's just spinning and it's out of control. What's going to happen next? Or we can adopt a worldview that says, God, you love me so much that you gave me your grace. You love me so much that you do have the end in mind. You love me so much that even if I don't know what the future holds, I know that you hold the future. Therefore, I will be grateful, grateful. Now, interesting, I'm, I'm, I'm going to give you this to just sort of hold on to for just a minute. Gratitude always involves three bennies. That says Benny fits. That's, that's the first Benny. But it, it involves three bennies. Think of all the words in the human, in, in the English language especially, that start with Benny. Benny means good or blessed. Benediction, speaking good. Speaking a blessing. All these words begin with Benny. And gratitude always involves three words that begin with Benny. The first one is benefit. Benefit. In order for me to be grateful, I must receive a good thing. I must receive a good thing. What do we have to be grateful for? Oh, I don't know. Let's look at Psalm 103. Praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his what? Benefits who forgives all your sins, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion, who satisfies your desires with good things. Do you think we can be grateful for those things? Do you think that grace produces gratitude when we understand the magnitude of the grace? So you have to have a benefit, but you also have to have a benefactor. In order to really understand, to, for me to be grateful, there must be one who does good. One who does good. Benefactor, we get our word factory, produces. We produce things at a factory, right? A benefactor is a good product. He produces good in us. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights. He is our we are the benefactor of what he has done. But then there's also the one who is the beneficiary. We are the one who received the good. See, for there to be gratitude, beneficiaries must believe that they are receiving something they didn't earn, merit, or deserve. Do you see how grace and gratefulness run hand in hand? If we recognize we don't deserve anything at all, and we receive it from his hand, then how could we be anything less than eternally and incredibly grateful? You see, lavish grace produces gratitude. Lavish grace, the kind of lavish grace that has been lavished upon us, produces gratitude. And when you think about that, Think about the ways that God has blessed. Think about the, the, the blessings that he has poured out on us. The, the ancient Hebrews, and actually the modern Hebrews as well, the, the, the Jewish folks, they, they practice what they call the 18 benedictions. Have you ever heard of the 18 benedictions? Every day, a, a traditional Jewish person is required to say two prayers. The first is the Shema. Hear, O Israel. Shema. Shema Israel. Elohei Elohenai. That's all I remember from Hebrew class. But I did that pretty well, didn't I? Aren't you impressed? That was, wow. Um, but the Shema. Every day they're required to say, Hear, O Israel. The Lord thy God. The Lord is one. Deuteronomy 20. But then they're also required to give the 18 benedictions. And some, some rabbis build on that. I was at a Jewish wedding one time, and, and, and it was beautiful and fascinating at the same time because the rabbi was a very, very traditional rabbi. And when they got ready to, to do the breaking of the bread, he blessed everything individually. 
He would bless the bride. He would bless the groom. He would bless the bread. He would bless the knife that was about to break the bread. He would bless the plate that the bread was on. He would bless the table. He would speak good, bless. He would call out good in every one of those things. That's what the 18 Benny dictions are about. Remember, Benny is blessing or good. Diction, we know, is word. Good word or blessed word, right? So all through the day, three times a day, the traditional Jewish folks were called to pronounce 18 benedictions. Blessed are you, O God, for the land. Blessed are you, O God, for my body. Blessed are you, O God, for my situation. Eight, three, times 18, three times a day, 18 blessings. I wonder if some of us couldn't benefit from looking and calling out where God is blessing. You see, gratitude, like we all like vaccines right now, don't we? Can prevent the invasion of a disgruntled, discouraged spirit. Like an antioxidant, gratitude can prevent the effects of the poisons of cynicism, criticalness, and grumbling. Like an anesthetic, a spirit of gratitude can soothe and heal the most troubled spirit. Remember the children of Israel? They were delivered out. I mean, can, can you imagine? Can you imagine walking across the Red Sea and you've got, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking of the Cecil B. DeMille Moses thing. Remember, they're walking through and there's water on both sides and all that kind of stuff. They walked through, they experienced that. They got on the other side and what they start doing? Grumbling and complaining. Grumbling and complaining. They had just literally experienced deliverance. And what do they do? They start grumbling and complaining and speaking against Moses and speaking against God and saying, you know, back there, at least we had leeks and onions. And what was the result of that? Forty years of wandering in the wilderness. Somebody told me one of their New Year's resolution was to get direction in 2021. Well, I wonder if there isn't some grumbling going on if you're feeling like you're approaching 2021 with no direction. I wonder if there isn't some grumbling going on inside your camp or inside your heart, saying, at least in 2015 I had a, at least then I had, even though you have experienced the lavish grace that calls you children of God. When somebody is aware of God's grace, Brendan Manning continues, he says, that person is just spontaneously graceful. I love that. Cries of thankfulness become the dominant characteristic of the interior life, and the byproduct of gratitude is joy. We're not joyful and then become grateful. We're grateful, and that makes us joyful. In around 500 to 504 A.D., there was a guy named, they call him St. Benedict. His name was Benedict. You might have heard of the Benedictines, the Catholic order. He was the one who started monasteries. He said, if we could just get away from all the distractions of the world and focus on God, then we would have joy. We would have all of the things that we want. We would be able to just really, really bring heaven on earth. So he started monasteries, and, and this is actually true. That This comes from, from the way that Benedict set up the first monastery. He said, first and foremost, there must be no word or sign of grumbling, no manifestation of it or any reason at all. But if any monk begins to sow discord among the brothers, let Father Abbott send two stout monks to explain the matter to him. <laughs> Vinny and Guido. You see, it doesn't matter where, <laughs> what, how hard we try to get away from that grumbling and complaining always seem to creep in. What's the solution? What's the solution? Gratitude. Gratitude that becomes joy. Gratitude for the grace that we have received. You see, without that grace, we would be hopeless. But with that grace, that lavish grace, we are children of God. Colossians 2, 7 says it this way. Let your life overflow with thankfulness. Let your life overflow 
with thankfulness. How do we, how do we get there? Real quickly, I'm going to step you through three, three stages of thankfulness. First one is perspective. Perspective. Get a perspective on what God is doing, what he has already done in and around. In 1 Thessalonians 5, it says this, Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. You want to know God's will for your life? Give thanks in all circumstances. Second one is protection. Protection. Ask God to set a hedge of protection around your heart. You have been saved by grace. You have been saved. You are being sanctified by grace. Ask, Lord, guard my heart. Guard my heart. For from it flows the wellsprings of life. And remember this. Neither height nor depth nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Protection, perspective, protection. And finally, practice. Practice gratitude every day. My son Christian turned 21 yesterday. How about that? 21. That's amazing to me. And I remember when he was just a little tiny guy, maybe six, seven years old. I came home from a meeting late one night and Christian's brother Roman was asleep, but I came in and I just looked in, in the room just to say goodnight. And little Christian, from under the cover, he pulls it down and he says, Daddy, I'm still awake. I stayed up to pray with you. And I thought, it would be so easy to just get going so fast through life and to get fast through every day and forget the way that God has given us so much to be thankful for. I looked over, I saw his sound asleep, and I thought, wow, he's finally still. Amazing. I went into Anna's room, and, and there she was, sound asleep as well, and I thought, what a blessing. Oh, my goodness, what a blessing. You see, this is the day the Lord has made. Today. Not just tomorrow, not just yesterday, today. If you want to grow a grateful heart, practice gratefulness today. There is so much to be thankful for today because God has made it and because you are his child because of his lavish grace. Be grateful today. In fact, let, let's do a quick exercise. Everybody hold up your, your left hand. Everybody hold up your left hand. Wiggle it a little bit. Say, God, thank you that I can move my hand. God, thank you that I have a hand to move. Those of us who are married and wear a ring on that finger, God, thank you for 33 years of wonderful marriage to my beautiful wife. God, thank you for this hand that can reach out and touch someone. Um, Be careful of that. It's still a pandemic, but... You see, we can be grateful and we can be thankful in all circumstances because God has blessed us in all circumstances because of his lavish grace. You see, lavish grace brings deep gratitude and overflowing generosity. You see, we, we, we can't, we can't experience lavish grace and we can't be full of gratitude without wanting to give that. John 3.16 tells us that God is a giving God. For God so loved the world that he what? That he gave his only son. You see, we can't be full of grace. We can't, we can't experience that grace and be full of that gratitude unless we're, we're also giving that. For some, it might be giving thanks today for all of the blessings that God is giving. For some, it, it, it's setting up to be able to give to the church out of the abundance that God has given, the tithe. For others, it'll be a matter of getting involved in the church in 2021, getting involved with other people, even at home, getting involved and stepping into Wednesday nights and and the well Bible study and small groups and other things. You see, we, we can't completely just receive and not give because lavish grace 
brings deep gratitude and overflowing generosity. Today we have the opportunity to come to the table of the Lord. I can think of no better way to start a new year than by coming to communion. Because you see, we serve a God who has lavished us with so much grace, so much love. That on the night that he was betrayed, Jesus himself took bread and check this out. He gave thanks. Have you ever thought to think about what Jesus must have been thinking when he gave thanks and he said, this is my body which is broken for you? He gave thanks because he knew that this was lavish grace. He knew that this represented his body that was going to be broken for the forgiveness of our sin. That his body was going to pay that debt that we could never, ever, ever pay. Have you accepted that lavish grace? Have you come to the place in your life where you said, God, I was dead, but now I am alive. I receive from you your lavish grace. His body broken for the forgiveness of sin. And then he took the cup and he said, not only that, he gave thanks for the cup. And he said, this is my blood and it is shed for the forgiveness of your sins. Compared to that, everything else pales. Because by forgiving our sins, he gave us the right to become sons and daughters and receive that lavish grace. Have you received the blood to cover your sins? If you have, this table is for you. If you haven't, we would ask that you not participate today because of what it is for those of us who have placed our hope, who have placed our trust, who have literally placed our eternity in the broken body and shed blood of Jesus Christ our Lord. Let's pray together. Gracious God, we thank you for the bread. We thank you for the juice. We thank you for this time that you have given to us to just slow down and realize this is the day that you have made. Realize that apart from your grace, we aren't just helpless, we're dead. But because of your great love for us, you gave us Jesus Christ. It's by grace we are saved. And that's not of ourselves. It is a gift from you so that we won't boast. And so, Father, we pray right now that you would set aside this little thing that I'm holding in my hand. It's kind of like a half and half. It is so meager compared to the feast that you have for us. It is so meager compared to the gift that you have given to us. It is so meager compared to the joy that we look forward to in your presence. But God, we do pray that you would set it aside from its earthly use and that you would use it to remind us of the great price that was paid, that your grace could be lavished upon us. And so we offer it to you now in Jesus' holy name. Amen. On the night he was betrayed, Jesus took the bread And when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, this is my body, broken for you. Take, eat, in remembrance of me. And after supper, he took the cup, and he said, this is my blood, shed for the forgiveness of sin. It's a new covenant, a new way of relating to me. Drink all of it, and whenever you do, you proclaim my death until I return. Amen. In the scriptures, it said that they sang a hymn, 
And so let's stand together as we sing about this immortal, invisible God, only wise, and pro profess our faith. this good word, the benediction. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, and may you overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Amen.